Okay, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter 1. And we're going to begin at verse 18 and read all the way through chapter 2 today. Matthew 1, and beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to put her away, excuse me, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof from the two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah, was there a voice heard, lamentation, and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose, and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. 
And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. It's obvious from the text we just read, and from this time of the year, what our subject matter is going to be. I preached this sermon about five years ago, and this is one of those subjects that as a Bible believer, you're not sure if you should even broach it, the subject, or even touch it. And if you do touch it, how far do you go with it? And so I said I was going to deliver a, a compilation of everything I had ever preached on this subject over the last 25 years. And I brought that sermon, which I'm going to attempt again, five years ago. And after the service was over, one of our men, who was also, is also a PBI graduate, he went to the same Bible school I went to, he approached me and said, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. Of course, I was thinking he's going to yell at me for even talking about the subject. And I said, what's up? He said, you know, Brother Shribe, that was probably the best sermon I ever heard on the subject of Christmas as a Bible believer. And I, but I felt good after that. He didn't squirrel me or yell at me at all. And God willing, you'll have a reaction similar to that or you'll get a blessing from it. At least I pray that you do. I call this Pastor Shribe's Christmas Sermon. I know that's not catchy. But there aren't a lot of other Pastor Shribes in the country. So you search Pastor Shribe Christmas Sermon, it'll come up. right on the internet. We don't make a big deal and push and promote Christmas here at Bible Baptist Church. Someone might ask, you don't believe in the birth of Christ? Well, obviously we believe in the birth of Christ. We just read it. As a matter of fact, as Bible believers, we think we have the most accurate account of it. We just don't believe in the idolatry of it. Christmas perpetuates a number of false myths about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The wise men didn't go to the manger. They went to the house, verse 11 says, where the young child was. They didn't go searching for a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Uh, the shepherds in the fields didn't see a star. The angels appeared to them because it says they were abiding in the same country, shepherds in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. So they were close by. They were nearby. They went to Bethlehem and found Christ the night he was born. The Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men came. Everyone says three because three gifts are listed. There might have been three. It might have been an entourage, ten, a dozen, fifteen. We don't know how many came. And Christ certainly wasn't born in December. Some say, well, then I guess we don't know exactly when Christ was born. Actually, we do. Actually, we can figure out when Christ was born. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 says, There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Jerusalem, or Israel, Bethlehem, is around the same uh, latitude, 35 degrees latitude as Southern California, right here. And it gets pretty cold over there, just like it does here. How many slept outdoors last night? <laughs> Nobody? Well, the shepherds don't sleep outdoors with their flocks at this time of the year either. By this time of the year, they had already taken their sheep into town, into the barns or into corrals, and they were undoubtedly sleeping uh, indoors like smart men should do um, at that time of the year. So that eliminates the month of December right off the bat, Luke 2, verse 8. Luke chapter 3 tells us that at Jesus' baptism, he began to be about 30 years of age. And you study the four Passovers the Lord Jesus observed in the book of John. You see that his ministry, his public ministry from his baptism till his resurrection was three and a half years. So if Christ died at the time of the Passover and he was 33 and a half years old, all you have to do then is count backwards 33 and a half years 
that would put his birth in the around the month of September. I'm using our calendar dates for easy understanding. We know when John the Baptist was conceived based upon when his father, Zacharias, was serving in the temple, Luke chapter 1, around late June, early July. That's when his turn to serve in the temple would come up every year. And John was six months older than the Lord Jesus. So while John might have been born the following Passover season, around that time of the year, he was conceived in late June, early July, when his father got done serving in the temple. And if he was six months older than Christ, it means Christ was conceived in the month of uh, December, but he was born in September. He wasn't born in December. That's three angles by which you can approach when Christ was born. Some go even farther than that, and they say, which great feasts on the calendar of Israel come up in the month of September, the seventh month? Well, there's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, probably the biggest feast on their calendar at that time. So we, we do have a good idea as to when Christ was born. The word Christmas means the Mass of Christ. It's a Catholic term. And so as Bible-believing Christians, we have to reject it. We have a conviction supported by the scriptures and supported by a lot of history that the Roman Catholic religion is a false church. It is not the church or the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ never intended to found a religious political organization in Rome, Italy, with a branch office in nearly every neighborhood. As the Roman Empire was beginning to fade and wane away in the 300s, the 4th century, something else was beginning to ascend and take its place. Known for several centuries as the Holy Roman Empire, now we just refer to it as the Roman Catholic Church worldwide. The head of that religion began to wear robes similar to the Roman emperors and the Caesars. The Roman Senate of advisors seemed to morph into the College of Cardinals that the world sees today. These provincial and territorial uh, kings and governors over different areas of the Roman Empire seemed to convert themselves over time into the worldwide uh, Senate of Catholic bishops throughout the world. And then priests and deacons and everyone below that. And it was not the simple Christianity found in the pages of the Bible at all. You couldn't read the book of Acts and see the lives of the simple Christians depicted on its pages and think that God was describing Roman Catholicism. No way in the world. World Book says the first mention of the celebration of Christmas occurred in A.D. 336 in an early Roman calendar which indicated December 25th as the day of observance. They say this celebration was probably influenced by pagan festivals held at that time. And they mention year-end celebrations by the Romans honoring Saturn, their harvest god, and Mithras, their god of light. It also coincides with the winter solstice this time of the year, about December 21st, 22nd, and the beginning of winter, which was observed by uh, ancient civilizations as well. And it was because of the paganism that Christmas had such a negative uh, identification or negative definition among real Bible believers. After, uh, while the Protestant Reformation was underway, and especially after the King James Bible was printed and distributed, Christmas was made against the law in England at one time. And it was against the law in the Puritan colonies here in the United States, early days of America. And it was, was because of the paganism attached to it that real believers didn't want anything to do with it. It was a Roman Catholic invention. Someone chopping down a tree and standing it upright so it doesn't move and then decorating it with silver and gold was a very ancient custom. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It's called the Ways of the Heathen. Jeremiah 10, the first five verses. 
it was also connected with paganism and the worship of the planets. Now, you might ask, Pastor Shrive, do you and your wife have a tree in your living room? Yes, we do. <laughs> I'll come back to that before we finish, I promise. The Apostle Paul says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. In other words, the only time you'll ever be completely free from the influence and exposure to worldliness and worldly customs and bits of idolatry and bits of paganism in just about every walk of life will be the day when you die and leave this world. Until then, you have to be secure in your salvation, secure in the Word of God, secure in the saving grace of God, and make the best of it as you go. I defy anyone here to go through uh, an entire month and a half uh, from Thanksgiving till New Year's and not be exposed and, and hit with Christmas on all sides. You'd have to close your eyes, put your fingers in your ear, and hide in your closet. And stay there for a couple of months. Because it's everywhere. You can't escape it. When someone wishes you Merry Christmas, don't panic and say, well, what should I do? <laughs> what you do is you smile and you wish them a Merry Christmas. They're not wishing you happy paganism. The, the unbeliever, he doesn't know the history of it. All he means and all you mean to them is whatever you do at home on your day off, I hope you have an enjoyable, happy time with your loved ones. That's about all you mean by it. And certainly we can use more of that in the world. There are some things in the Christian life for which there are no hard and fast cut and dried rules. Paul talks about some of these things, and he says, let every, one, excuse me, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, Romans 14, verse 5. What I don't understand are true believers, true saints of God, they know that they're saved, they know their name's written in heaven, they know they're going to heaven when they die, and uh, they're ignorant about a lot of these things, but they want to remain ignorant. Don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me, because he'll ruin my good time. You know what that is? That's, that's somebody that God can't do anything with. He can't work with them. He can't use them to glorify Jesus Christ along the way because they're not in submission to the Word of God. They don't want to know the truth. They're not in submission to the will of, of the direction of the Holy Spirit. Better to have all the information between you and God. And then you, between you and God, you have to decide how much you can participate in. A lot, a little, or not at all. And uh, every believer should respect every other believer who has different degrees of conviction about it. I used to be very rigid and narrow-minded when I started learning the history of Roman Catholicism and the history of, of Christmas and all the idolatry attached to it and the origins of it. My mom and dad were decorating the Christmas tree one year. I was probably 18, 19, long in there. And I just got upset. And I said, that, that, to me, it looks like an idol. I can't stand looking at it. I know I hurt their feelings, and I, but then I thought later on, my mom and dad don't worship a tree. They don't worship idols. It's one of those little customs and habits. Everybody does it in society. It's a, it's a, a fixed thing that helps the family do something together. Very few families do anything together anymore. They don't sit around the table and eat dinner together anymore. You know, you find something uh, to use to bring families closer to each other from time to time. And that's the way life has to be, at least in our society. But uh, I, they must have thought I was becoming some JW, you know, you don't have any fun. And um, Jehovah's Witnesses can be very obnoxious. They, they're right about everything, and you are wrong about everything. All I have to do is talk to them. You'll find out. I worked with a guy uh, who was a Jehovah's Witness. Actually, a couple of fellows over the years that were JWs, and they both had sort of the same conduct. 
Every year, the company provides a, 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 a luncheon in our lunchroom at work. And one guy, he would refuse to participate because it's called a Christmas lunch. So he would sit in the office at his desk while the rest of us were having lunch. Can't be celebrating Christmas, you know. Don't celebrate birthdays. He did wear a wedding ring and remember his, an his anniversary, you know. You better remember that. Your wife will kill you. But... Uh, so he would sit in the office and not participate in the so-called Christmas luncheon. But he wouldn't refuse the Christmas bonus check when the boss would pass those out. And everybody saw the hypocrisy. And I made a, a, a note to myself. I will make more progress trying to witness to them if I'm not like that guy. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. You use a little bit of discernment, that which has to come from Christian maturity and years dealing with people, talking to different people, uh, encountering people with different beliefs and knowing how to navigate through some of the nonsense out there in the world and still have your sanity about you and still please Jesus Christ along the way. I realized I'll be a better testimony to people I work with if I'm not quite as rigid as that guy is. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Well, that's all introduction. Let me get to my outlines. Very short, three points today about Pastor Schreib's Christmas sermon. First of all, consider the prophecy of his coming. The prophecy, or rather the coming of Jesus Christ with the unique fulfillment of prophecy like no other man. Verse, or chapter 1, verse 22 says, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Chapter 2, verse 5, For thus it is written in the prophet. Verse 15, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Verse 17, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet. Verse 23, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. Matthew recognized the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the birth and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He quotes from the Old Testament prophets 12 times in the first four chapters of Matthew alone. The Jews had accurate records for their scriptures. They knew when those things had been written, and so do we. Uh, Jeremiah wrote 600 B.C., the book of Isaiah 742 B.C., the book of Micah, 712 B.C., and the book of Judges, 1143 B.C. About 50 years ago, there was a, a man named Peter Stoner, and he was the mathematics and astronomy chair at Pasadena City College, and then Westmont College in San, Santa Barbara after that. But Mr. Stoner was a believer in the Word of God and in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he set out to calculate the chances of one of 48 major prophecies about Christ's coming, all being fulfilled in one person in history. When he would be born, where he would born, be born, how he would teach, and so forth. And when he was finished, his calculations were, were that uh, for the odds of one person being able to fulfill all of those different prophecies with the different variables attached to each one was one chance out of 10 to the 157th power. That is 10 with 157 zeros after it. Only one chance out of all of those that all the prophecies made about the coming, the birth, the place, the ministry, the teaching, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ could have all been fulfilled by one man. And yet they were. Now, if God, the Son, can beat all the laws of statistical probability simply by being born, you have no reason to doubt that He can take care of you. Amen. If He says there's a home in heaven waiting for you, believe on it. Believe it. If He says your sins are forgiven, the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, believe it. 
If he says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, bank on it. Do you know him? But consider the prophecy of his coming. Secondly, I want you to consider the panic of his coming. Herod did what all politicians do when they get scared. They got religion. It says in verse 3, he was troubled. He was troubled at the idea that there might be another king who would come along and take his place. Politicians haven't changed much in 2,000 years. They don't believe in term limits. Uh, they can't win elections if they promise to promote vice and sin and immorality. You know, a president has to court favor with a religious crowd before he can then push uh, abortion on everybody and gay rights and gay marriage and everything else on everybody. He doesn't campaign that way. They campaign as if they're one of you. But then they run the opposite direction so often. He said, in, it says in verse 8, Bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. But he didn't want to worship Christ. He wanted to kill him. He wasn't alone. Our text says in verse 3, He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Jerusalem means the city of peace. But there was no peace in Jerusalem that night or that day. Some people, for some strange reason, like, like it when things are bad. They like it when there's a corrupt leader in charge. They like it. They like life under a bad ruler. They don't want the thought of God or God's words or God's man coming along and uh, pointing a finger at them and uh, exposing what they're doing as sin and ruining their fun time. They don't like it at all. Liberals don't want the Ten Commandments in a courtroom of all places. The idea that there might be another king who would come and take away their pot and take away their gay marriage and take away their abortion clinics and everything else. They didn't like that. They wouldn't like that. But causing a panic was why Christ came. He said, I think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Can you imagine that at this time of the year? Peace to everybody, peace on earth and goodwill. Christ said, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Matthew 10, verse 33, verse 34, excuse me. Matthew 10, verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Christ's coming created a panic because it separated those who were on God's side and those who weren't on God's side. It drew the line very clear. Thirdly, I want you to consider the promise of his coming. The wise men asked, verse 2, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. God wants to give light to someone who will follow the revelation of God that they have by giving them more light. It must have been a very unusual star in the night sky that they saw. See, in those days, they didn't have radio. They didn't have television. There were no daily uh, newspapers. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have any electricity. There were no uh, city lights obscuring the night sky. They sat up, if they were awake at night, and they saw a clear sky. All they saw were the stars. They watched the stars every night. They, what a boring program. Actually, it can be a very interesting program. I'll tell you what you do. And I don't normally recommend things on the internet because you should get your nose in the book rather than Facebook. But... Um, Find one of those time-lapse videos of the North Star and some camera that's fixed on the North Star and watch all the other planets in the night sky orbiting around it in a circle, perfect circle. Over a course of maybe eight, nine hours, you'll see all the stars in the uh, night sky moving in a perfect circle around the North Star. It's fixed. And uh, you can also find videos taken in the Southern Hemisphere, say from Australia. There's a, a corresponding place to the south of the Earth, and they'll find a, the center of focus there, and all the stars orbit around that spot in the opposite direction. You know what that means? It means the Earth is round. It's not flat. So don't be fooled by some of the nitwits on the internet, we believe in a flat earth. You have a flat head. <laughs> but 
but it must have been a very unusual star that appeared in the night sky. And they must have been able to tell that that's not a heavenly object out in space. It's something closer to the Earth. Let's move in that direction. Whatever they knew about the, the planetary objects, or whatever they knew about Jewish prophecy, told them there's something going on. Let's go in that direction. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Clarence the angel trying to get his wings. In the beginning of the movie, he's talking to other angels in the night sky, and they're, show, they're portrayed as uh, stars blinking, flashing as they speak to each other. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20 says, The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And coincidentally, just about every Christmas tree is topped with either an angel or a star. So it must have been an angel guiding the way. They would see bright every night uh, as they were heading that direction. Let's head towards the west and see what's happening over in Palestine. But be that as it is, God promises to give greater light to someone who follows the light he has. If you reject what light you do have, don't expect to learn more from God. You know, when you have a Bible in your hands, and you're not interested in reading it, but you're interested in getting all of your doctrine from YouTube, or, theology, or from some other cha YouTube channel, don't expect to learn anything. You've got the light in your hands. Herod gave great advice. He said, go and search diligently for the young child. Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you seek after God with the light you have, God will give you greater light as you go, until your spiritual needs are met, till your questions are answered, until you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're only interested in religious customs because that's what your church has always done or religion has always done, forget it. You're not going to learn anything that way. But these men were just that. They were wise men. They were wise men. They followed the light God gave them, and they were rewarded with greater light when they found the young child, nearly two years old by this time. If you live how God wants you to live and do what you know God wants you to do, I promise you, it'll be easier for God to get your attention in the future. You're at the grocery store. You're going through the checkout line. There's the lady behind the register is busy, and you've got people behind you. You have a gospel track in your pocket. Say, listen, I know you're busy. I want to give you something. Read it when you have time. If I see you again, you can tell me what you think of it. Um, but don't, you know, I don't want to take up your time now. Just do, just do that. That's all you have to do. I promise you the next time it'll be easier for the Holy Spirit to get your attention because your antenna is up. You're in tune with the voice of God. He wants you to do something. He wants you to talk to somebody. He wants you to pass out a track. And there's no better place to hear the voice of God than in the words of God. In the book that God's given you, he hold in your hand. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the word of God and the light of the world. John 8, verse 12. These men were wise because they sought out the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24 calls Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Do you know something? The day I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, begging God to forgive me, that was the wisest decision I ever made in my life. And it's the wisest decision I will have ever made in eternity. Did not resist the prompting uh, and the uh, provoking of the Holy Spirit. Don't sit there and hold on to your sin. Get up and ask God to save you and forgive it. Amen. Do something about it. I want to try to bring this to a close. Some of you are still wondering, how can Pastor Shribe, Mrs. Shribe, have a tree in their living room as Bible believers? 
especially after Jeremiah chapter 10 is so clear about the ways of the heathen. I'll give you the answer I can give. Because of something Jeremiah writes in that same passage, Jeremiah 10, verses 1 to 5. First of all, he says, Thus saith the Lord, verse 2. So these are God's words. And then verse 5, Be not afraid of them, the trees, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. It's a tree! Are you going to be afraid of a green plant too? Are you going to be afraid of, you know, flowers in your garden? I mean, after a while, some people want to be so right, they end up being wrong and ridiculous. I don't worship the tree. My wife doesn't work. By the way, we don't even have an angel or a star in the top of our tree. We have a big uh, Frosty the Snowman head. <laughs> That's what my wife did. We don't worship the tree, but it's one of those holiday things. Everybody does it. It makes the house smell nice. and Plus, it's a good place to put my presents when something... <laughs> I mean, where are you going to put them, right? You've got to have a tree to put my presents under there. Anyway, we enjoy getting together as a family. And if sometimes you have to have a, something to prompt you to do what's right or to do something good with your family, your loved ones. Some men don't tell their wives they love them and how much they mean to them unless it's their birthday, unless it's your anniversary. It's too bad, but some men need a date on the calendar to promote them, prompt them to do what they should do anyway. The Jews had to observe the Passover every year so they wouldn't forget. Some things we're required, we ought to do, and we need a reminder to do them. Thank God he cares enough about us to, to save us, whether our understanding is always perfect about every subject or we don't understand anything at all. Some people want to be so right in their interpretation of doctrine, yet they might be jerks and, and they drive people away. The ministry, and this is something I learned from my dad, the ministry is people. The ministry is people. If you don't show an interest in that lost soul or in that young Christian to nurture them and help them to grow in their love for the Word of God and see them mature and develop, and have questions answered to them that uh, they might have done so. Listen, somebody comes in here and they're all tatted up and body pierced and everything else. Oh, they can't join our church. Why? 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 They make that uh, uh, unre unreasonable. I can't join their church because I, you know, I pierced my ears and my nose and my eyebrows and my tongue and my lip and everything else. I got tattoos all over. God's not interested in that. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looketh on the heart. Amen. We don't have enough grace with one another. And we, don't, and we don't appreciate the grace of God in navigating our way through these kinds of things. I wouldn't bring a tree into a church because not everybody has that, that measure of understanding that it's okay. The tree can't hurt you. But let's, let, let you know. Don't go all the way with, with, you know, those kinds of customs and idolatry and paganism. You, know, if you want to do it in your living room for your family? That's your business. But don't bring it here and try to force all believers to see it the way you see it. Some of you might not have any kind of tree and say, I want anything to do with Christmas. Some of you say, I want to celebrate it and go as far as I can with it. And then some of you are in the middle saying, oh, maybe a little bit here, a little bit there. That's why I said at the start of our service, we'll sing a couple of Christmas songs and then go back to our regular scheduled program. Yes. 